future planning can be shared is what Delta cities should aim for. And while some Delta cities already have collaborative agreements, this conference, it was felt, had helped to forge new ones and stronger ones. And indeed, last night, as an example, um, host city Rotterdam and New Orleans signed a formal letter of intent. So the conclusion of this round table is that this is the way ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henk van Schaik, Rory McLeod, and Barbara Groom for taking us uh, in a very brief overview through the round tables of this morning. And actually, two of you were talking about acting and rolling up the sleeves, and uh, I'm not sure whether you know it, but Rotterdam is always said to be famous for its ability to act, and you can find out for yourselves because it is said that in Rotterdam, when you buy a shirt, it is sold with the sleeves already so, uh, rolled up. And there is a big department store across the street from the conference venue where a large sale is going on. So if you feel the need to find out for yourself, you maybe can do this this afternoon. So I would now like to introduce to you Ms. Anna Fornels de Frutos. She's the chair of the Ethics and Finance Committee of the Adaptation Fund Board, and uh, she already spoke in the round table this morning and she would now like to address the whole audience about, as her function name already states, the ethics, the ethics, I'm very sorry, the, uh, the ethics in, uh, the, in relation to the adaptation fund. Ms. Anna. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I promise that those that attended the roundtable of finance of adaptation, I'm not going to give the same presentation. As you see, this one is completely different. I will talk about ethics and the adaptation fund. First of all, I would like to say that for, for the adaptation fund, there are two key principles, impartiality and independence. It's really important that in the decision making of the adaptation fund, these two principles are respected. That's why we have two different legal tools, the oath of service and the code of conduct. But also there is a need of an institution, of an institution that really guarantees that these principles will be respected by the members and alternates of the adaptation fund board. And this is the committee that I have the privilege of chairing. It's the Committee of Ethics and Finance. And what does this committee is to oversee the implementation of the Code of Conduct. And also sometimes there could be misinterpretations. So we deal and try to address them. And we also deal with the consequence of rating this Code of Conduct. The first time when I came to the Adaptation Fund Board, they gave me a paper. It was the Oath of Service. And then when I read this paper, I discovered what I had to sign. There are two different uh, scenarios that could happen and could appear during our session, during the Adaptation Fund Board sessions, and that are really important to find a solution and find a procedure to face them. One of them is that we deal with documents that sometimes are confidential and are very sensitive. I will give you an example so you will get an idea of why it's so important to have at least this scenario included. In, in the Adaptation Fund Board, we give uh, resources to implementing entities. These implementing entities are those ones that are responsible of the management of the funds. But we are not going to give them the money if they don't prove, if they don't get the accreditation that will prove that they meet the fiduciary standards. For getting the accreditation, it's very important to describe, to describe that they fulfill with the different requirements and to provide the documents. Sometimes these documents are delicate, so 
That's why these are confidential. What are the implications? Once you see the document that is seen by a panel, we have a specific panel that deals with these questions, they have to comp they assume the compromise that they will not disclose any information they will get from these confidential documents. Not during the term of any member, an alternate, but also you don't have to disclose the information afterwards, once you are outside the Adaptation Fund Board. And a second situation, it's uh, the conflict of interest. I will explain later on, but you cannot forget that projects and programs are presented by governments and some of the representatives that are participate in the Adaptation Fund Board represent government. So there could be a conflict of interest. So once uh, there is a conflict of interest in the oath of service, you are obliged to not participate in the concrete deliberation and decision making. And well, I'm proud to say that in the 10th meeting that took place in June, we developed the code of conduct of the Adaptation Fund Board. And the main, well, I will explain with an example. When I'm chairing the adaptation, the, my committee, the Committee of Ethics and Finance, the first agenda item is to ask other members of this committee if they have any conflict of interest with any of the agenda items. If they identify that they have a conflict of interest, they have to tell us, tell the, well, tell the committee, during the committee. And they will not only not participate in the, in the deliberation, but they have to be absent. This is very important for the other committee. We have two committees, my committee, the Committee of Ethics and Finance, and the Committee of Projects, the Review of Projects and Programs. In this committee, if a project of their government is going to be reviewed, they have to be absent from the room where this review is taking place. So the Code of Conduct has gone one step further. In conclusion, I would like to say that uh, if you want to get any information from the Adaptation Fund, you will find here in the web page more information. But uh, one of the key messages is that in the Adaptation Fund Board, we are we feel that it's very important to send a very strong message to all parties that we want to protect and guarantee that the independence and impartiality is full respect. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna, for your contribution. I think uh, you've showed us that not only filling the fund is a very difficult job, but also handling all the applications requires a lot of, uh, uh, well, a, a lot of, um, how do you say it? it, it it's, it's very delicate to handling all the applications, and we wish you a lot of success with your good work. And now we're nearly at the end of our conference, and uh, still we have one more winner to announce. Um, on Wednesday, when we started the conference, we had the competition of the Delta City of the Future. Yesterday, we also had a winner to announce in the Delta competition. And today, we have one more. Today, uh, it considers the best young science award of the conference. And the award will be announced by Mr. Carlos Nobre, who is from the National Institute for Space Research in Brazil and he will guide us through the exciting moment where we hear uh, which of the uh, scientists will win the prize. Mr. Nobo, will you join me on stage? Good afternoon to all. Uh, I have the honor of being chosen to present the winner, the winners, in fact, there are two winners of the Young Delta Scientist Award competition 